Hey, Theology Nerds, this is Bo Sanders. We are back from our summer hiatus and things are in full swing. We have lots of interviews coming up, lots of topics for discussion on the Theology Nerd Throwdown. And before we got too far away from it, I wanted to bring this discussion about young people leaving the church uh, to your attention. So, a while ago, before Wild Goose, I had a conversation with Mickey Jones, and then I recorded something with Johnny Russell that uh, the audio didn't turn out on. I had also recorded something with Tripp um, about the same subject, but because of the way things fell together with the last TNT, it didn't work to kind of tack all of this stuff on. So, before I discarded it, because we had moved too far away from the initial conversation, I thought it would be fun to put this out there and to have a conversation. Um, so this is not an official Theology Nerd Throwdown. This is a bonus track. And it's based off of an article that Rachel Held Evans wrote this summer on CNN, the religion blog, about young people leaving the church. I had a great conversation with Mickey Jones. That's going to be the first thing you hear. And then Tripp and I compare some notes. And that's the second thing you'll hear. I would love to get your feedback on this, to have a future conversation about uh, relevance and mission, and so you can feel free to comment on the bottom of this blog, or to call into the speak pipe, or to comment on the Facebook page. We will be collecting those in order to form uh, the framework for a future TNT about young people in the church. All right, it is time once again for our Theology 101 segment. Welcome back, Mickey Jones. Hello. How have you been? You've been busy. <laughs> yeah, we've been busy at our house. Yeah, and you uh, also uh, have been on the Culture Cast since we last talked. <laughs> yeah, so I had a good conversation with Jordan. Yep, yep, that was good. And if you, you haven't listened to it, everybody needs to go listen to it. It's great. And then you blogged at Rage Against the Minivan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a little post be, there about, yeah. uh, being a, about being a black middle class mom. Some Obviously some good traffic and lots and lots of shares. Yeah. So. It's been really great. Hey, I wanted to ask you, uh, Rachel Held Evans last week put up a blog post over at CNN about millennials leaving the church or what they want from the church. And then our friend Johnny uh, wrote a blog response to that on Homebrewed Christianity, and you posted a comment on that blog that I thought merited some further conversation. So why don't you give us your take on Rachel's uh, post and how that conversation has looked for you in the last week? The Probably the resident most evangelical or most still in evangelicalism, I guess. Um, <laughs> I, that's, I mean, I felt like I should hop in and comment. Um, I'm really familiar with Rachel's work, and I've read both of her books. I read her blog pretty regularly. Um, you know, and I think it, it, the responses were interesting. I mean, what she said is no different than what she's been saying for a long time. She, she says this kind of all the time. I, I mean, it's what she posts all the time. But you know, the reactions have been kind of coming from two different camps. They've either been like, um, well, the mainline church is already doing all this stuff, and so all you whiny evangelical millennials or Gen Y, whatever, you need to all just become mainliners and admit that you want to be mainliners. Or it's, you know, just grow up and be part of the church and stop whining. So, it, it, like, we're not going to fix the evangelical church for you. Just do one of those two things. And I really don't think either one of those is what we're asking for, we, as in being younger generations. I don't think we're asking... I don't, I, there's there's something about becoming mainline if you're evangelical. First of all, a lot of evangelicals don't even really consider mainliners Christians. <laughs> really. Um, and then, I mean, they do, kind of, in a way. Um, but maybe not totally as Christian as they are. Um, mm -hmm. And because I, I come from a very similar area. Like I've been to Dayton, Tennessee. I actually mm -hmm. did a project in high school about the Scopes monkey trial and went to Dayton. <laughs> that's a whole story in itself, but that's mm -hmm. a really funny story. 
that's a whole that's a whole subculture that if you're not in it, it's hard to understand. But you know, there's this. I mean, just in church this Sunday, uh, our priest you know threw out the eighty percent of the kids in the church are leaving and never coming back. And I'm like, okay, here we go again. And it's that you know evangelical lament of all the kids leaving the church, and oh. you get those two responses. And I, you know, what it boils down to is kind of the white middle class kids are leaving in the South. Is everybody leaving? I don't know. And and just telling us to either be mainliners or be like, or just get over it isn't really working because I think we're looking for something totally different. I agree. What we're looking for is what everyone is looking for. It's no different. It's just this, maybe this generation is louder about it. I don't know. Maybe we're just not willing to sit there and, and hold on. But I think what people are looking for is a relationship. We want actual, real relationship because we don't necessarily have communities that provide relationship anymore. We're so in the suburbs or we're so, you know, driven by our careers and our lives and, and, you know, people don't get married now until they're much older. And so you don't have a built-in community. And, And the church isn't providing community, so it doesn't have anything to offer there. And then when it does provide community, that community means you can't really ask questions. So maybe we're looking for a deeper, richer, raw community that says, yeah, you can be a community, but that doesn't mean you have to be a robot. Mm. And so often, yeah. you know, to be in the church has meant you have to now conform. You And not just conform religiously, you have to become essentially the dominant culture. Yeah. You have to be, being Christian also means being white or being what is what those standards are. And really, to have a revolution, maybe it's that we have to take all those barriers down. We can't. It, it doesn't. It can't be ethnocentric. It has to be welcoming of of what those different cultures are, what those different beliefs are. To be a Christian doesn't mean you have to be radically on the right or radically on the left, but that we can come to the table with lots of different beliefs, but we're united by Christ. And I think when you just say, "Well, just just be a malin- just be a, a mainliner," well, but I may not feel like that's me. Like mm-hmm. I don't want to just go sign up for something else. I want a yeah. community that's going to let me be me, but also mm-hmm. will still be in community with me without trying to make me what the community that already exists. I know I hate that. I mean, I'm at a mainline church now. I hate that logic that says, "Oh, the mainline's been doing this forever." You know what else you've been doing forever? boring the crap out of most people who even think about right. coming to your doors. Because if you're from right. a rock and if you're from a rock and roll background, if you're a go getter, if you have an entrepreneurial spirit, if you want to make an impact in the world, sitting through a mainline service might actually just sap the joy, life and inspiration out of you if that is not your upbringing or your frame of reference. That is the stupidest comment I've heard in a long time is just, well, you should join the main line, be Episcopal, be uh, Orthodox. It's, that's not what we're talking about. Way to miss the point. Uh, one of the things I miss about an uh, evangelical church that we used to attend is it was the most racially diverse church we ever attended. Mm-hmm. And they really try. I mean, first of all, their leadership intentionally was was mixed and then worship would be, you know, a guy, a country white guy with a guitar. And then the next week it would be somebody who would rap. And then the next week it would be a Native American. Like, they were really, that was a huge thing. Wow. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are, there have got to be mainline churches that do that. But that's, you know, sometimes it's so about the liturgy that they they won't pull out and do that kind of a thing. So mainline is not the answer. I mean, yes, it, it can be appealing to somebody who's come out of an evangelical background that has no structure, you know, and, and then it's like we're swinging to the opposite side and we're like, oh, bells and smells, that's so cool, because we've never had that. Yeah. But uh, eventually that wears off because it's right. still not culturally, it doesn't, it's still just European. Yeah. And it's novel, and I get that, right? But the simple fact is, you know, we're like at the Loft LA, we're utilizing an ancient future kind of a model of a church. We've hybrid it 
with a, uh, I used to be a cell church pastor in New York, and so we're, we, we've done a hybrid with that cell church conversational style. And so we've, we've kind of mixed those. But the thing that I, I'm so convinced we need to deal with is the fact that, uh, it's, that this conversation is happening in a capitalist framework, not a Christendom framework. And so yeah. the church, let's say the Church of England, we don't have a Church of America. So it's right. completely irrelevant. Those forms and structures are irrelevant if you weren't raised in them, or they are novel. And my hesitation is that people buy into them in the same way uh, that they want to learn a new vocabulary to order at Starbucks, you know, a venti, this, grande, what you know, they you learn new words, it's novel, and it satisfies something in our consumer mentality. And now we're paying, let's be honest, for an experiential or an immersive uh, environment that is novel. And it's, But other people are there who think it is the primary form of church. And for us, we are simply consuming a religious experience. The difference with what you're doing at the loft, I mean, just from what I can tell, I haven't been there, but it goes to my other point, that that it's the other answer is not, okay, you guys just need to grow up. You know, we're not going to give you a cool church experience. You know, you, you, you younger generations, millennial, why, whatever, you just need to buck up and realize that holiness requires you to learn from your elders and to, you know and and Rachel she did a follow up piece where she said you know this is what we need from the church and we don't need we don't need you to cow to us necessarily we need you to um you know we need you to relate to us but we also need substance so i get, i mean I, I think she was kind of trying to come back around and saying no 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 wait i wasn't saying you need to change everything for millennials I was just saying, you know, we need to learn from you and you need to, and I get that. And I, and I, I kind of liked where she was going with that because she, she tied it to different sacraments, essentially, and said, you know, that we as the young people need to come towards that, but the church also needs to move towards us. What I would suggest is that if they're, if, if, if they're calling us to holiness or if that's the thing, is like, well, you need to learn from people that have come before you and it's not just about doing what millennials want to do and what feels good to them, that's fine. But that happens in relationships. People move a position. People learn from each other. And the young can learn, can learn from the old. The old can learn from the young. You know, people of different backgrounds are going to learn from each other, but that happens in relationship, which happens around conversation. And we're right. still doing the same old thing and slapping yeah. a new name on it, whether it's, you know, wh- whatever these church plants are doing. Because, I mean, you cannot throw a brick without hitting a church plant where I live. Oh, wow. Um, but it's the same thing. You you slap a new you know uh, big screen TV on it or event or whatever, but it's still one guy getting up and talking for an hour. It doesn't build community when one person talks for forty minutes. I mean that's just not going to do it. But would you, when I mean what it looks like you guys do is you get in circles, you have conversations, you do things together. Even on a, you're not worried about losing a Sunday. Mm-hmm. packing boxes of food for the homeless. That's fine yeah. because that's growing in community. That's allowing conversation to happen. It's allowing, you know, yeah, scripture might come up while you're packing a box full of food, and that's okay. Development, if that's what the other solution is, well, you still, millennials, you still have, you still have things to learn from the church. Well, yeah, let's let it happen in other ways than just, you know, the same whole, you know, you got to have worship and then a sermon and then, passing out a piece and blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. You know, let's branch out and have things that actually make communi- community happen versus just, well, we have to have church and now, you know, you also have to attend a, a life group and you also have to attend our community service and you also have to, I mean, people just aren't going to, I mean, they're just not doing that. Yes. We've got kids to raise and things to do and, yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I think you're absolutely right. Hey, one last thing I want to touch on in this. I, the line I saw quoted the most from Rachel's piece was the one that said millennials have been highly sensitized by a lot of advertising and they have BSers. They know they're not really easily impressed by performances. That's the line I saw yeah. get the most quotes. 
but it was actually a later line that really impacted me the most when she said, when millennials really want, what millennials really want from the church is not a change in style, but a change in substance. And I just don't think people even, I don't think they know what they're hearing when she says that. I actually think that yeah. at, at, at some level, that sentence is almost like speaking a different language. And the reason that people yeah. don't hear it is they don't, they don't even know what she means by that. Some people are going to interpret that, I think more conservative are going to interpret sure. that as, well, we're not going to change the message of Jesus. Exactly. You know, we're not going to change what, what the church is saying for yeah. a new generation. You know, they just need to get with the program. I mean, and maybe that's that side of it that's saying we're not going to change for millennials. And uh, I think, you know, maybe the other side is the, the come over to the main line of saying, hey, we already got the substance. Like, we've been helping people for years. It's already yeah. here. You know, so I don't think people know what that means. But I think what she's saying is we want authenticity. We want real community. We want to be able to be who we are and live together. And, and, and maybe that's because that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm of, I mean, everybody's going to put their own lens onto it. It's hard because what, what does that substance mean? Because people would argue they already have that substance. We have, mm -hmm. you know, we're standing for something. We're standing for the truth of the gospel. And I hear a, a call for something different. Yeah. All right. Good thought. I am glad that we followed up. I thought that uh, your comments were packed, uh, and I wanted to unpack them a little bit. I'm glad we did that. All right. Sounds good. Cool. Hey, Trip. What? So... You, unfortunately, didn't get to listen to Mickey Jones uh, because I have not figured out the technology to let you listen to my conversations with her ahead of time, and I apologize for that. But I did get to hang out with her and her husband and family a lot. I days, heard. Which is That awesome. sounded awesome. I did want to talk to you a little bit as a fellow youth pastor about why young people are leaving the church and, more importantly in my mind, why people are freaking out about it. Yeah, and, and this came up because of the Rachel Hilde Evans post. I'd see it. I like Rachel, really so why don't you say, why don't you summarize whatever the... So, yeah, no, but, I mean, people have just heard the, the conversation with Mickey, and Rachel, you know, she said that they have a high BS meter because they've been advertised to their whole life, and her example was they're tired of the anti-gay rhetoric, right? And they can't bring their friends, and the, so there's a whole bunch of elements going on. But my thing to you is because you and I go to – we work at a different type of church. So if young people come to our church – this is why I wanted to talk with you about this – is because young people in our churches, because we both work at mainline churches as youth pastors, aren't leaving the church for the same reasons that people are leaving the evangelical church, which I just talked about with Mickey. Young people are leaving our church for a different reason. And I want to talk about, like, is it relevant? Is it connecting with them? Is it fulfilling a need in a consumer-based, right, society? So if they came to our church, they're not going to hear the BS meter. They're not going to be offended by the anti-gay rhetoric. But it doesn't necessarily mean that once our kids leave our youth groups and go to college, that they're going to seek out a United Methodist or a UCC church in their college town and keep going to church they may leave the church, and then when they have kids, think, man, I need to get them baptized and confirmed, and so I'm going to go back to church. In our situation, unlike the conversation I had with Mickey, kids leave our churches for a different reason. Why do you think that is? Um, I, I think that if you just look at kind of the story of America with religion, that mainline Protestants were the um, kind of – uh, culture dominant religious faith uh, for America prior to the kind of rise of the religious right and the moral majority. It's why they were called the main line. Right. And so we uh, really did a good job at making good citizens, employees, and that kind of stuff um, for uh, the United States and, you know, up through the 50s and stuff. And we started going down when um, the denominations took stands racial integration anti-vietnam uh, uh pro worker union rights and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff and yeah. um once it started costing um money and prestige and stuff 
in the denomination. You were hearing things that were more threatening to your identity uh, as a as a producer in our economy or a person of privilege and stuff. The main line started going down, and then the evangelical right rises up and it's like, no, 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 religion's about personal, you know, personal kind of morality and Holiness. going to heaven. Yeah. Um, and so I think there that part of the reason mainline Protestants uh, peop, youth end up leaving the church is because, well, if the mainline Protestants are still saying all the same stuff, well, you definitely don't need to go to church to be a Democrat. No, I mean, your college covers that for you. Completely. And uh, if you want to care about even the contemporary justice issues, like uh, planet, poor, uh, gay rights and marriage, that kind of stuff— well, going to going to worship service isn't necessarily necessary. What do you get out of it? Sleep in, watch football, and then go to you know an evening yeah. activist group or volunteer and that kind of yeah. stuff. So I think that what happened with mainline Protestants were um, that they that well they don't know how to pray and they don't know how to read the Bible. They have a liturgy, they have these traditions, yeah. that kind of stuff that meant something really different. Um, to people in the past than it does in the present. Ago. And that the reasons for being there uh, on Sundays, mm-hmm. for going to a church in the traditional sense, yep. if leaving the church means not going to First UMC or mm-hmm. UCC, that kind of thing, then I think it's because, well, what's being gained in the community? I, I don't think there's a whole lot that's being gained by those t- that get up. And so, I you know, for me, that is... The, the biggest problem, and I think connected to it, is that a lot of people that want civic religion without the jesus stuff or the uncomfortable things go to mainline Protestant churches because it's like, oh, yeah, you know, it's like morality and God, mm-hmm. but, you know, it's not all that, like, weird, we don't like gays and no raptures and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So you go to a mainline Protestant world. church to get your, your yeah. morality, civic religion in. Mm-hmm. Well, well, you don't need it when you go to college. You, you like and you get it back when you go to kids. Like they're actually doing what you want them to do as we're training them to do it. Yeah. Right? In a sense I I think that we're aiming low. We may not be doing wonderful Christian education, spiritual formation stuff. But when it goes to playing the role of doing what we need to do for training good citizens, then uh, mainline Protestants are, are are doing excellent and they just don't really need to go all the time. And and what's the percentage of mainline Protestants that come once a month, definitely come on Christmas and Easter, and come for all the special family activities with photo ops? Lots of them. Uh, we we have, uh, in my church, we've done more baptisms in this past year, one-year baptisms, than have ever showed up one Sunday for church school for kids. Oh, wow. So that's, that's crazy. It is crazy. But let me throw out, because we I think the one thing that ties Catholic, evangelical, and mainline churches together is this one thing. When our kids go to college and they encounter the masters of suspicion, Freud, Darwin, Nietzsche, and Feuerbach, their faith is rocked. Whether they've gone through confirmation class, whether they've been baptized, it really impacts them to hear the critique of religion that they are not prepared to defend, and it pops a balloon to use a theme from earlier and i think that ties catholics evangelicals and mainliners together and and what what mainliners tend to not do well um is the uh actual spiritual formation learning spiritual practices building community and that kind of stuff and one of the things i found um at at my time at two different mainline protestant churches are when the youth get really involved and um, pick up, I don't know, the the uh, evangelical residue of trip or something, I don't know, um, that, 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 that actually ends up playing the role uh, in a different way. Because it's not like if you're, if I'm your, if I'm hanging out with you every week for three hours, if you hear Masters of Suspicion and stuff, I doubt any of my youth have been shocked by that if they actually are participants. Um, the crazier thing will be when they show up, and I and I've got this at their mainline Protestant kind of campus ministry groups. That you know, my youth are the ones that are like, "Hey, when are we going to do centering prayer? Do would you like to write targums on the you know like the lectionary passage and that kind of stuff?" Um, and 
that uh, for me, I try to deconstruct the faith of that they've inherited and that they've been given with Jesus. And because adolescents and early adults tend to deconstruct everything, and Jesus deconstructs things much more radically than their professors ever will, uh, that their peers will, and the, and their parents are just not really interested in it getting deconstructed that often. So I found that Jesus is a wonderful compatriot for deconstructing the world you've been given, and uh, one that when you start doing the practices and stuff uh, actually opens up a much more rich life. And for my youth, actually, going to Wild Goose has been a really helpful thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, this past year, I had a couple that have been there the second time, and uh, they're the ones then talking the first timers into going to uh, morning prayer in the river at seven in the morning with Phil Wyman uh, for doing body pr- body prayer contemplation in a river. And they're the ones that are like, you got to go see Barb- Reverend Barber preach his uh, rambunctious prophetic from the African-American church tradition sermons. And, and, they're, and they're like, invite them into it. And then they're, they're there trying to find out uh, some of the seniors that, you know, they're now in college that this is kind of their last thing. They're like, well, you know, where are churches that, where are churches with people here from the city I'm going to school with? Because whatever, uh, one of the unique things about wild goose is it's not just kind of progressive Christians, but it are ones that, 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 uh, still, uh, that still pray, that still mm-hmm. practice, yeah. that it is a robust kind of activist, grace-filled life stance. And I think that that, uh, the community there, gives to my youth that end up going um, a taste of what a, a, a passionate, progressive Christian faith would look like. And, uh, and I think that can help and keep them, and I'm not so worried about, like, keep them from leaving the church, but keep them from walking away from the resources and community and really support system when a bunch of humans uh, get together and try to live their faith out in the world. This has been a Theology Nerd Throwdown. We'll pick it up here next week with Khaled Keep Perry and uh, hypertheism as we flesh it out. Thank you for tuning in. We love your feedback. If you would like to give us some questions, comments, concerns about this episode. Freestyle rapping. Freestyle rapping. Come to the homepage. Click on the microphone on the right-hand side. It's called a speak pipe. You can leave us a message. We love your feedback. The final word goes to Eldrin Fuller. Um, and I, my name is A.O. Elgin. Hi. I, I'm... The- I'm I'm Bo's fan friend. I have a friend named Bo at my preschool. He used to be in my um preschool book class. And now you're in so, kindergarten. Yeah, now I'm in kindergarten. So um subscribe to this video. <laughs>